Tonight we're going to look at miraculous surgeries, and and like I said, I've had glimpses of this, and this is this is going to be really really fun, and I'm I'm very excited about this, and we're going to begin the evening with um, Dr. Uh, Doug Hannell. He is the professor of orthopedics and sports medicine at UW um, School of Medicine, and also the um, director of the orthopedic education and combined hand surgery program here as well as head of the Pediatric Hand Surgery Program at Seattle Children's, um, and Plastics and Reconstructive Surgery, um, and part of the UW Working Group at Harborview since 1992. He is a leading expert in surgery in hand and wrist and elbow disorders and birth um, defects, but, and practices his uh, practice focuses on um, reconstruction of congenital hand um, differences, which actually is kind of what I will be very interested in looking at, given that I um, deal with a lot of prenatal diagnosis and um, uh, uh, congenital anomalies. Um, but here we have him doing, it looks like, what sounds like a really fun thing, which is his fishing with his gorgeous pink hat, which is just beautiful in color, as well as against the blue sky. Where is that in Alaska? Or where is that? It's on uh, Bashan Island. Just Vashon? Just Vashon. Wow, you could have said something very exotic <laughs> and we would have believed you. <laughs> but I see you can read all of his credentials, but I get to talk about the, that, those eyes and those cheeks adoringly looking at her grandfather. And he tells me today that this little one has a four-day-old sister, so I congratulate him. Um, but as you can see, his accolades are all there, as well as being the Hall of Fame um, top docs um, for Seattle Magazine. So without any further discussion from me, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Douglas Hannell. Well, thank you, and good evening. Um, this is going to be pretty graphic, so if you really are offended by blood and gore, um, this is going to be bloody and gory. Okay? It, it, by nature. So you've graduated from medical school. This is who you are. You're about to graduate from medical school. And now you're going to become a microsurgeon. You're going to do what I'm going to do. And this is what it would take, or this is where my residents come from right now, this pool of patients. Not where I came from. I was, I'm, I was a truck driver in, in <laughs> undergraduate and managed to make enough money to go to med school and, that's, and then ended up here somehow. But in our residence, right now, that represents the t either valedictorian or salutatorian of their high school. They graduated for, as valedictorians or salutatorians in the top 2% of their college. Their med school, they represent the top 5%. They played a team sport. This is kind of important. They played a team sport in college at the same time that they were getting all these academic accolades. So they're pretty smart people. And they continue to play the instruments that their parents made them play in about 30% of the time. Also importantly, they carried a minimum wage job and had to actually do something that required them to get up, go to work, and do something and answer to somebody else other than themselves. They published research while in medical school. You did. You completed five to seven years of residency, and to become a microsurgeon, the discipline comes from either general surgery, vascular surgery, orthopedic surgery, putting bones and other things together, and joints, plastics and reconstructive surgery, which Dr. Nelligan will address, head and neck surgery, which Dr. Nelligan will address, and neurology. That's who uses this discipline that I'm going to talk about today, which is basically what happens when you do this. And as you look at this class, in times past, when I started, you know, when I started medical school, and you ask the question, who are these people right here, and here, 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 and here, those were the nurses. Now, 
These are all hand surgeons in the United States trained in our program. So 40% of the hand and microvascular surgeons that we are training now are women. So that's right. Yay. So your pager goes off right now. Boom. Just went off. And it's the transfer center. And the transfer center is a place that physicians from all over the, the, the Whammy District, Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, and they call you and they say, we have a 21-year-old male. It's, uh, he has four fingers that have been amputated and his thumb. And that's what it looks like on x-ray and that's what it looks like when it presents to the emergency room. So what I'd like you to be able to do today is I would like you to be able to say, what would I do with this short and long term? Short term being immediately and long term being what are we going to do with this person after we get done with him or he gets done with us? Okay. And then I would like for you to predict how this is going to turn out and then what's going to happen. You know, what would happen and what will the outcome of this hand be if we were able to put those fingers back on or build a thumb? So that's our job. But just a brief history, because this started a long time ago. And it started you know, with the Greeks. And they viewed organ perfusion as four systems, four fluids that were running together, that the balance of those fluids in your system, in our bodies, made us who we are. And so those are the four humors that they had. You had yellow bile and black bile and phlegm and, and blood. And so those were the evil humors. So what would you call a bad mood? You were ill-humored. And that's where that phrase actually came from. So, also at this time and things that we continue to use, you know, Hippocrates said, first do no harm. And when we look at this and we ask what we're going to do with this particular patient, you know, we also have to ask, if I can't make you better, I've got to make sure that I don't make you worse. And so that's one of the questions that we ask every time that we look at a patient and the patients that you're going to see this evening. Now, Galen was a, a Greek surgeon, but he worked in Rome. And he was really the father of sports medicine. And, and his first team, well, it wasn't really the Grand Junction Gladiators. It was these guys. He was the team physician for the Gladiators. And he learned a lot of things. He learned that, that if you take and you touched a nerve, as in a cut nerve in an arm, the patient would convulse. He also espoused that if you were going to remove arrows, from legs and other body parts, you'd have the patient stand. Because if they laid down, they died. And if they couldn't stand up, they were going to die anyway. So, I mean, that's how he taught it. In 400 AD, two guys, Damien and Cosmos, took the leg of a moor and transplanted it onto the leg of a man who had a cancerous lesion. And for that, they became saints. Now, we really don't, we know that they were able to do this, technically able to do this, because of what was happening between Islam and Christianity in southern Spain at that particular time, and then it was lost for us. So, and, and if you do that, you get to be a saint. Do that today, you don't get much, but you know, they got sainthood for that. In the 1500s, people started to question Galen. And they said, maybe blood pools around in circles. Maybe it has a circuit. Maybe the heart just isn't a wash like tides going in and out of an estuary. Maybe there's a pump and a river and a system that goes in and out by this pump. And so that's the 1500s. A guy named Morgan, he discovers or it describes anesthesia. And immediately, and this is in Georgia, outside of Athens, Georgia. And he describes it, and it's published, and he spends the rest of his life suing people that are infringing on his patent and dies a pauper. In 1946 to 1950s, this is really important relative to us and what we're going to do today because the biggest event that happened relative to vascular surgery is we started repairing it. And we repaired it at that time by being able to sew on vessels. And so the difference between an arterial injury resulting in amputation in World War II at D-Day, which was about 80 to 90 percent if you survived, was in Korea, or at the end of the Korean conflict, Korean War, was somewhere around 20 to 30 percent because we learned how. We, a collective group of physicians, learned how to repair vessels. So in the 1950s, we developed and took the dissecting microscope 
the binocular microscope, and we turned it into a tool that we could use operatively. And why does it have to be binocular? Well, here's why it has to be binocular. So everybody in the room, cover one eye. Okay. Now take your other finger and try to poke it into the head of the person next to you. Okay. <laughs> but keep your eye covered. Keep your eye covered. Okay. Now you have to struggle to do that. Now just touch them softly. Now take both eyes and look at each other and then touch the person next to you. And it's the fact that having two eyes to look through and two microscopes to look through, we get to see things in 3D. And that's why it was so important to devise the dissecting binocular microscope. It allows us to see things in three dimensions at a power of about 40 power. In 1960, a surgeon named Malt in Boston replanted the arm of a young man who had his arm torn off while trying to jump on a train. And for those of us that are around 60 years old, I can remember reading in the Reader's Digest about this miraculous replantation that occurred in 1960s when I was a 12, 13-year-old. In the 1970s, we had rumors that the Chinese, that Chinese surgeons were able to put fingers back on. We didn't know how, but they were able to put them back on. And in the United States at about the same time, a surgeon named Harold Kleinert in Louisville and Harry Bunke on the exact same day one in San Francisco, one in Louisville, successfully replanted a thumb. Now, what they were able to do is they were able to look at and were able to devise ways to sew vessels that were this small. You see in there, that small. And that's one millimeter vessels. And to put that in perspective, and this is just, this is, this is a molt, that the surgery and the size of the vessel would be on your left. That's the size vessel that Malt had to repair in order to put the arm back on. The vessels on your right, those little tiny vessels, are what doctors Kleinert and Bunky had to repair in order to put a digit back on out at the very end. So that's the difference in the scale of things that were being done. Another way of looking at this is this right here, right there, that represents a human hair. So that's a human black hair. And if it was blonde, it'd be a little bit whiter than that. Okay? And this is the suture and the size suture that we use right here and right here to repair these vessels. So this is about one half the diameter of your hair. And we do this. And we learned how to do that technique. Now, this is a very important picture because no matter what you think about Richard Nixon, the one thing that he did do is he actually opened up the doorway to China. And one of the first things that he did after his visit in 1972, and he brought the first delegation of scientists, he brought Harold Kleinert and Harry Bunke to China to discuss replantation and microvascular surgery with the surgeons in China at the time. They were part of that very first delegation. And with that, we, we were able to, and with the benefit of a man named Robert Acklin devised ways to mass produce the suture, that's the size, or one half the size of the human hair, onto a little needle that is the size of a little tiny wire, and be able to do that. And then Robert Acklin taught us how to do techniques, or taught us how to keep our hands from shaking, and doing lots of things so that we can actually perfect the technique to do that. So between the 1970s and the 1980s, everything that got cut off got put back on. And that was wonderful. Kind of. But what it allowed us to do, and this is the youngest case that I've done in my practice, was an 18-month-old whose hand was taken off in a boat winch, and we were able to put it back on. And this is her hand at five years, when she was five years old. But the other thing that it allowed us to do is it allowed us to think about how can we reconstruct the rest of the body? What if I amputated a part of the body, moved it out from someplace, moved it someplace else to fix it? So I could take a toe. I can move it up to a hand. I could take a muscle from the side of your chest wall and put it down to your leg. And so here's the muscles right here. Here's a latissimus dorsi and a little muscle called the serratus anterior, and they're attached to the same thing. We could elevate those muscles right here and right here off the chest wall, shown there. And we can move them down to this leg that has this terrible wound right here, and we can reconstruct that leg and keep it from being amputated and 
If we can get the bones to heal, make it useful. In the 1980s, we had 40 plus territories that we, dis that we devised that we were able to take things off and put things on. And this is a little girl who, as a result of a lawnmower injury, lost her index finger and her thumb. We took her second toe. We made a thumb out of that by moving her second toe up to the thumb position, an elective amputation. And so then it became a matter of what do we do and what's the right thing for the right job. And again, Dr. Nelligan is going to show you that in, in the most exquisite uh, uh, way possible, in ways possible. Some of the things that we do do is, is, is we can take territory from the side of the arm right here, and th this, is, this is really great because you know, this goes back to the issue of be careful about your tattoos <laughs> because this is a dad whose 16-year-old son is looking at Mr. Zigzag. And he says, you know, I've got this wound right here. If you can take this skin off here, why don't you just move it down there? So Mr. Zigzag's off my arm. And so we, we, socially, this was a very, very good thing to do for him and for his leg at the time. And, and you know, so then it comes from the sublime to the ridiculous. So, you know, so we remember Richard Nixon, the Chinese, and replantation surgery. So there was actually a, a replantation of a trunk. There's been replantations of ears and noses and, and, other, or, and other appendages uh, relative to that. And so now it's kind of mundane, you know. According to the National Examiner, I can regrow lost arms and legs. I'm still looking for that article, but if you read down here, I can shrink my waist by four inches in 14 days. I'm pretty sure that I, we can do that, but I'm not sure that we can regrow arms and legs yet. But one of the things that we did do is we looked very, very closely at our results. What happens if you come in and you have an amputated finger and I attempt to put it back on? Well, it has a 90% chance of surviving, 80 to 90% chance. But in order to make it work for you, you're going to have at least two procedures on that. Those subsequent procedures being freeing up scar, moving things around, trying to make things work for you. And when everything is said and done, the only thing that you're going to get, you're only going to get 50% of your motion back, only 50%. So if your finger goes like this and comes all the way down to here, it's only going to go from here to here. And the same with your wrist and your arms. We also learned that the, our sensibility, our return of sensation, if you're a little kid, it comes back and it's absolutely near normal. Definition of a little kid is 20 years and younger. Between about age 20 and 30, you're not so little. After 30, the best that you can hope for for your patient is the ability to differentiate cold from hot, very dull from sharp. That's all that you can hope for. Now, we have ways of measuring this. And one way of measuring it is there's a correlation. If I can take two parts, two points, and spread them apart by five millimeters and touch your finger, and you can differentiate that, that's the same thing as being able to put your hand in your pocket and differentiate between the smooth edge of a nickel and the rough edge of a quarter. And we cannot do that in adults, in adult replantation. You actually have to take your coins out and actually look at them. So, and then can this extremity tolerate cold? And the cold tolerance is directly related not to the blood supply to that digit or hand or part. It is directly related to how good your sensibility returns, how good your nerves return. So with a closer look, you look at function and go, what is the impact of me telling you that I'm going to replant all of your fingers. You're a mom, you're a dad. You have to carry out a livelihood. You have to make a livelihood. What is the impact on your ability to be able to do your job? And what is the cost of that? And we looked at this in the, in the 1990s. We looked at it in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And, and, and part of the issues in the, this slide was, was adjusted or managed to jump over. But, the cost of doing replantation surgery, the total cost of hospitalizations of things, is upwards of about $160,000. Very, very expensive. Now, if we just, re, just replant it, or did not replant it, just put it away, just close the wound, the cost, the medical cost, are about $40,000 if you take everything. And this is everything into consideration, including lawyers. Okay? And the workman's compensation cost is equally, it's almost treble in replantation surgery than in amputation surgery. 
And the return to work rate is much, 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 much longer. So the return to work rate, if I just revise an amputation, is somewhere around six weeks. Where if I replant a digit, the return to work rate, the time to return to work rate, is closer to a year, one year, after doing that. So somebody, and we, we put that in, it has huge impact on that. What we have also found out is that not everything that comes off can be put on. And so this is a cartoon that, that, that appeared in a magazine called The Stranger back in uh, 2001. And the artist is, and the cartoonist is, is Ellen Forney. But she ran a series of how-tos. And just as an aside, so this is, you know, Mrs. Hanel, mom. You go, hey, mom, I made it in the papers. And, and send her a copy of The Stranger. Well, you, you know, you have to read all of The Stranger before you send it to mom, OK? <laughs> so just to keep that in mind. But what it does do and what it underscores is she actually calls and says, you know, when these people blow their fingers off at that, that on the 4th of July, what should I tell them? And I should tell, and my answer was, we can't put it back on. And so what we did learn is that if you have a very sharp cut, knife, low energy, cuts the finger off, we can put those back on. Because there's nice sharp cuts, nice sharp wound edges, low energy to that. And a little bit duller knife, a little bit harder, but we can put those back on. If you make it a broad compression, that gets a little bit iffy because you've got these broad levels of injury. And then the worst things that you can do is if you pull this off, what ends up happening is the nerves go this way, the arteries go this way, and the muscles get torn up. And so people will come in and they'll have these beautiful looking hands and they'll say, why can't you put this back on? And the reason is, is that all those parts are pulled out. Or if you explode a hand, 4th of July, um, when you're 60 years old and you are the director of the hand program, you don't take call on the 4th of July. <laughs> okay? because all you're doing is revision amputations. And this is why avulsions, yeah, we can't put this on. And these happen to be the tendons and the muscles that were attached to those in the arm and that were pulled off. We cannot put those on. And so that would be a revision amputation. We now know that the indications, and we agree that who should we put these back on? If I have a limb whose energy, sharp cuts, narrow cuts, we can put that on, and I know that I can return function to this patient, then we will put those on. So if you're missing central digits, the middle finger, ring finger, we'll put those, we'll try to put those on. If you have four fingers amputated, we'd like to at least get two of those fingers back on. We'll attempt to put all four back, but practically speaking, we will just put two on the central digits. And we try to always replant thumbs, just because of the importance that a thumb plays in, in our activities. And we're sort of relative to the, to the distal form, distal to here. At a wrist level amputation, we will put those on. Proximal to that, you have to be pretty young to get a good result and to have a functional result. What are the contraindications? We are not going to do this surgery. We are not going to do this surgery if the surgery itself will kill you. So if you have heart disease, if you had previous heart attacks, if you have prolonged hypertension, if you're a diabetic, the chances of this, the anesthetic risk of prolonged anesthesia um, will down those. Because for every digit that comes off, you count four hours. That takes a minimum of four hours to put on. So you got four fingers off, that's 16 hours of surgery to replant that. You take a hand off, it's about 12 hours of surgery or 16 hours of surgery in those particular cases. Adult lower extremities amputated do terribly. We know that, so we don't replant those. And mental instability, that is uncontrollable. So it has to be truly uncontrollable. And I have cases where I've had a schizophrenic, schizophrenic patients who have cut their hands off. And because they went off their meds. Putting them back on their meds or replanting their hands, putting them back on their meds, they've actually done well. And so I argue that what were you like before you went off your meds? Were you able to sustain and carry on a, a relatively normal life and take it from there? So, and then how long can it be detached before I can put it back on? And the more real parts, the more muscle it is, the less time. So, 
the cutoff is about six to eight hours if it includes muscle, arms, forearms. And for digits, it can be up to 24 hours after it's replanted. One of the absolute contraindications is somebody who says, I can't stop smoking, or I don't want to stop smoking. And that includes your 16-year-old kid who's got a little pinch right here and plays a lot of baseball. Because the nicotine level of chewing tobacco, spit tobacco, is twice that sustained nicotine level of somebody who's a two-pack-a-day smoker, which is why this is a terrible, terrible disease. And, you know, that's, it's a terrible carcinogen that happens and, and, and causes cancer in your mouth just because of that exposure to that nicotine. So what do we do with these patients when they come in? We make sure that the only thing that is injured is their hands. We make sure that their heart, their lung, their liver, everything else is okay from this very, very distracting injury. And if it's a digit, we'll get one unit of blood. If it's a large extremity or our arm, we'll always have on hand four units of blood because we're going to be using and losing a lot of blood during this particular part of the procedure. And we do the simple things, making sure that your immunizations are up to date, especially tetanus. We rinse off the part, we rinse off the amputated part, and this, unfortunately, is a four-year-old child who crawled under, the, under a, a fuel truck, and the power takeoff took off his arms. So we, what did we do with that part? What did we do with the amputated parts? We take those and we look and see what we can use of those amputated parts to see if we can build an extremity or a useful extremity in those particular cases. But we wipe off the, wash off the gross contamination, we get an x-ray, put it in saline soap towels, we run it off, and then we get it, this patient to the OR as fast as we can. One of the things that you don't do is you don't put this in formalin. You don't preserve it. You don't pickle it, literally. You just put it on ice and keep it cool and keep it in place. And this happens to be just a styrofoam box with ice you put the amputated part in a moist gauze and put it on place. Now, what do we do when we finally get him, get him or her to the OR? And we, we take off the bad stuff, the contaminated stuff that's debriding the wound. We fix it. That's orthopedics. We fix the periosteum. That's from my orthopedic background. We fix the tendons. That's from my plastics background. We fix the veins and the arteries, that's from my general surgery background. We fix the arteries and then we finally fix the nerves. That comes from our neurosurgery background. And so this is an amputated thumb and index finger. The injury to the index finger is such that I can't put it back on, but I can put the thumb back on. And so we clean up all the parts and put it back in place, but I have to fix it. And how do we fix it? We use little nails that look like finishing wires or we use plates and screws or we use wires that are looped around each other. It's basic carpentry. It's simple carpentry. And it's not even very sophisticated carpentry, unfortunately, or fortunately for us, because we can do it very, very quickly. We put those back in place, and then we fix the tendons on the back side so the fingers can go up. We fix the tendons on the front side so the fingers can come down. And then we fix the vessels. And so the veins that we have to repair on the back of your hand are about this size right here. Those are these little veins back here. And the arteries are about this size, and that's a one millimeter vessel. And so for those of you that have a piece of paper in front of you, what's a one millimeter vessel look like? Look at the inside of the circle of the A in any of print material. So at a, about a font 12, the inside of that A in a printed small letter A, that's about the size of the diameter of vessels that we're repairing and that we have to keep open. So we repair those, and then we repair the nerves. And so, and everybody lives happily ever after. No, actually they don't. Only 80% of them do. And this is that patient about six months later after replanting his thumb, the one that we put back in place. Now, if you have a forearm level amputation, and you're a little kid, we're going to try to put that on, or an arm level amputation. But the one thing that we do right away is we put the arteries back together, and we let everything that's in this arm drain out onto the operative field. Because sitting in this arm for the last four hours, it's been metabolizing something called lactic acid. And if you take all of the lactic acid that's building up in there and you give that to that person straight away, hooking up the veins first, then the arteries, that patient dies. And how do we know that? We've done that experiment. 
And we know that that will happen. And that's something that happened back in the 80s when we were first starting to do this. And, and we obviously don't do that anymore. So here's our four-year-old. This is his arm. We put it back in place. We sew it back on, and we're able to take parts from both arms in order to replant this in this particular child's case, and that's his two-year result. And he is now about 20 years old, and he has maintained most of his function um, to do that. We manage the patient postoperatively by just filling everything up. It's, it's kind of like having so much fluid that they have to pee all the time. And we put them in a room that's really, really hot, 80 degrees. And why do we do that? Because think about it, every time that you're in, the high white, in a room, if it was 88 degrees right now, you'd all be sweating. All your veins would be wide open. Your vessels would be wide open. We do the same thing there. And then we give one baby aspirin. And we do that because it knocks out the platelets, one of the, one of the small um, clotting mechanisms that happens. And in very desperate times and very desperate measures, we will actually give them heparin, which completely dilutes it, and we'll actually use leeches but they have to be French leeches. <laughs> this is no joke. They have to be French leeches. They can't be North American leeches. So we, well, we have a pharmacy that has an aquarium, and we have to use French leeches because French leeches will suck, will, will only go after oxygenated blood. So it has to be good blood, whereas American, North American leeches, they'll go after anything. <laughs> you know, so, so we have those. And, and there's something that actually happens is you put a leech on and it fills up and it, it actually consumes about 10 times its body weight in blood. So it sucks out the stuff so that new blood can come in and helps get, establish the circulation that's happening. It takes about five days if you have to use leeches for the body to make enough capillaries and enough veins to take over so you don't have to spend the rest of your life with a leech sticking on your finger. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's really amazing what, what how calloused and how tough you can get, how tough kids become and how tough moms become, dads never become tough. <laughs> yeah. Kids, moms, dads never make it. Okay? The leeches just gross them out all the time. So, and, and then there's, there's another thing that the leeches do is they spit this stuff called harudin. So if ever you've been sucked on by a leech, whether or not it's French or North American, and you pull it off, you sit there and you bleed a lot. Okay? And the reason is, is because this little leech actually spits something else called a harudin and it actually anticoagulates all the blood around that. So you just sit there and bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed for you know, twice as long as you should. So that happens. Now, we start motion early on to help get things going, and we're very, very aggressive. But if we have a hand-level amputation, we actually put them on a machine and have them start moving right away in, the, in that machine. And this is an example of a young man who cut his, ha his wrist off in, in a, um, a chop saw, okay? And a chop saw is, is a power miter saw. It's a wonderful instrument. And if anybody has a chop saw, you look at this and go, how did he do this? I still can't figure out how he did this, but I'm pretty sure alcohol was involved. <laughs> but we were able to replant that. There's his replanted hand in place, and it swells. And because it swells, we put skin grafts, and so that's the skin grafts and plates. And here's plates and screws holding the bones together. And if we go over here, and this is his result now at about um, a year and a half after, after his surgery. So he makes a hand and, and puts it into place and has his motion back. And he actually has returned to school and actually has done well with his life. So. A summary to this, not all replantable parts should be replanted. Only some of them do. The best results are the farther down a digit you can get and have it survive. Those are going to be your best results because everything functional is behind it. The risk results are in lower extremities. We don't do lower extremity replantation because of that. First aid is critical for the management of the part and for the management of the patient. And patient satisfaction is related to what this does to their life relative to their responsibilities personally and to their family. If we look at it. So what happened with this guy? Well, as it turns out, this guy's working in a sawmill. And he happens to be your 18-year-old son who's in his, between his freshman year and sophomore year of being a mechanical engineer. He's working in the sawmill. So what we did with him is we took him to the OR, and we were able to replant Four fingers, but not his thumb. 
And we came back a year later and took his thumb, or took his second toe, and turned it into a thumb right here. And the follow-up on that is he ends up graduating, but a year later, with a year delay, it goes on, gets married, and carries on. Thank you. You say that you cannot um, replant the lower extremities. Uh, what kind of research are you doing? Are, are, you, are you doing research to get to the point where you can replant them? And can you say anything about that? Yes, we can. Yes, we can successfully replant the lower leg, but it doesn't work. So I can put a living, I can make a living stump on the end of this. But we found that the return of sensation and the return of muscle function is so much poorer than prosthetic replacement that we can uh, that we have stopped doing that. And so from the 1970s through about 1985, we did. And then a person named Peter Stern and uh, his colleague in Cincinnati, last name is Cottle, Robert Cottle, I believe, um, looked at all of their results and looked at all of our results across the country. And it turned out that the results were so bad and the cost of these people as far as their livelihood was so bad that um, we stopped doing that in that particular case. Do we continue to do research? Absolutely. You know, and so that's where our research is. How can I make our results better? But we still have not done well with the lower extremity. Yes, sir. Um, how widespread are these reimplantation capabilities? Is this something that's only happening to, to a couple dozen major academic medical centers? Or yeah. Yeah, The answer to that is it used to be done all, every, every hand surgeon, as part of his training, was learned how to do that. The problem that happens is it's hugely time consuming. It's hugely resource consuming. And um, because of that, um, people looked at the results and they found that they actually happened better and areas and locations where there is a replantation team. And so I would venture to say that in the Pacific Northwest and in the Whammy District, um, the University of Washington represents probably 95 to 96 percent of all replants that are done. And that's from Alaska and from uh, Wyoming, Montana. But for the most part, and if you go down to California, there are two centers in San Francisco. There's two centers in LA. There's, two cent there's one center in San Diego. And then as you go across each state, um, you can probably identify one center in each state that is doing replantation surgery. And is the uh, Harborview ER the gateway to this service here? It is. Yes, it is. That's the University of Washington. And although I, I spend my operative life at, at Harborview and at Children's, I would like to point out that we are the University of Washington. Yes, sir. Yeah, I guess um, I thought that once like a nerves were cut, you know, they could no longer be reattached or something. I was wondering about like when an arm gets cut off, how it can be that an arm can work. <laughs> so, you know, it's so it, that's a that's the million dollar question, and that is really where all of our research and all of our money really needs to go into that because it isn't. It's beyond the mechanics of me putting these nerves together. So imagine that you have a line, okay? And this telephone line goes from Tacoma to Everett. And we cut this line right here in Seattle. Now, if it's a telephone line, all I have to do is splice it together and it works. In the human body, what happens is, here's the brain, and we'll call Everett the brain. I got paid to say that, okay? <laughs> and, the, the end organ, we'll say, is, is, is Tacoma. Well, if it gets cut in Seattle, the nerve has to grow all the way from Seattle down to Tacoma. And the problem that happens is it's not like putting this wire and just watching it go down there. It actually takes a long time. And a lot of times, the fibers, the number of fibers that we have just drop off. They scar. They don't do well. Little kids, they do great. They do wonderfully. And once you're past about 35, 45, then it gets to be a crapshoot as far as who's going to get recovery and who's not. And so that spreads out, and then it goes into the muscles, and then those muscles start to fire after that. So the time from amputation at this level to these muscles firing right here, 
It's about nine months. Yeah. Um, with the blood supply, especially just in these really small areas, what percent do you actually repair surgically versus spontaneously repairs itself, like major arteries or capillaries? Like how much do you actually repair? So if both the artery and the veins are separated, we have to repair both of those in order for that extremity to live. Because artery puts nutrition in, it's used, and then there's the exhaust. And so it's the equivalent of if you take, the veins are like the exhaust in your car. If you shove a potato in your exhaust pipe, your engine's going to stop running. If you run out of gas or you clog the fuel line, it's going to stop, the engine's going to stop running. The same thing happens in every piece of tissue that we move around and repair. We always have to repair an artery, gives it nutrition. We always have to repair veins that allow egress of the metabolites. And if either one of those clots, the flap or the finger or the extremity will fail. Yes, sir. In, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, sir. In, in terms of medical insurance, is there a, a rule of thumb, no pun intended, for, for reattaching digits or, or extremities, upper extremities, uh, pre-approving or, or approving for, of such a procedure? The, 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 the shorter answer is absolutely not. And that's the only, one of the privileges of what I do, is, is do, and in doing this, is I don't have to ask that question. All I ask, the question that I ask every patient and everybody that comes to me is, can we do this? Will you be better served by a successful replantation, or will you be better served by not doing this? And uh, luckily, we uh, don't have to answer that question. Uh, I wondered if one would be in a situation where one, in the first aid situation, where somewhere in the woods somebody has cut off a limb, does one put the tourniquet on above, and what does one do with it until one gets to the place? Okay, great. So the, the, to repeat the question is, you're out in the woods, and your knucklehead partner has just cut off his or her finger. Yeah. It, it'd have to be his finger. All right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so what do you do with that? What do you do with them? Well, one is don't put a tourniquet on anybody. Just direct pressure on limb wounds is, is more than you need. And, and so you don't use battlefield tourniquets. Direct pressure is what you do with that. You take the part and you put it in anything that's, that you won't lose it in. Okay? And you all laugh. Okay? Because in the heat of the moment, and we actually have, and this is a very sad story, but we, have a, we all are aware of a very, very good friend of ours who cut off four fingers and in his excitement gathered up the fingers, put them on the top of his car, drove himself to the hospital. No fingers. And he was a cardiovascular surgeon. So a true career changer. So, you, you know, so what you do with the part is make sure that in all of your excitement you hang on to it. If you can keep it cool, if you happen to have ice with it, please do just that and put it on ice. Do you think it's possible that you could transplant a human brain? <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank you, Frankenstein. Um, the answer is yes, you can transplant a human brain. It's just a bleeding or Can you get it to function? And the answer is probably not. First brain transplant was done by a, a surgeon in uh, Missouri. Uh, his last name was Wood. It was in St. Charles, Missouri. It was in 1860. And he transplanted the brain of a dog. And uh, he actually had that, that dog and that brain survive but didn't function for 48 hours. So. Could you take a limb from a donor and attach it to a live person? Can you do limb transplantation? And the answer is yes, you can. And not without great cost, and we're not talking finances, which it is a great financial cost, but you have to, it is like any other organ. You have to actually suppress the recipient site's um, immune system in order to receive that. And those are being done. Yes? Um, I was wondering if there's any role in stem cell research and replantation, or how that's being? The answer to that is 
There's a lot of research, and we're not seeing much of anything happening from that. And it's not that we won't. It's just that we don't under, the, the, the term stem cell is this broad term for pluripotential cells that we, our human body, says, you become this. And there's a couple of organs in the body that actually can take a stem cell and become that. One of them is bone. It actually makes bone cells. And so turning this on and taking these pluripotential cells and saying, I can give you the information to make this is what we need to do. And it's not going to be done by surgeons. It'll be done by surgeon scientists or in the lab. But right now, we don't have the capability of doing that. But that's obviously where we would go with that as, as surgeons. Thank oh. you. One, I actually have one question. That is, you're out in the field, and so this happens. What time frame do we have? You know, we do the right thing, put it in <coughs> ice, we come back down from the mountains. Come down, and, and so the, the, the time frame for replantation of, of arms and legs and things is um, if it has muscle attached to it, you've got eight hours. Eight hours, that's it. If you don't have muscles attached to it, so your muscles start from here down. So mid-hand amputations, or even a wrist amputation, about 8 to 12 hours to get that and done, and done well. Um, fingers, a lot longer period of time. And so we do have cases where we have had patients that have climbed out or hiked out of, uh, uh, out of the field and then gotten themselves to a hospital, then gotten themselves to Harborview. And the time frame from amputation to replantation has been 24 hours.